ahead and start the recording. Hello, and welcome to FACTS webinar, Getting Your Farm Funded, Understanding FACTS Fund to Farmer Grants. Our guest presenters are Larissa McKenna and Cara Shannon. I am Samantha Gasson, FACTS Humane Farming Program Manager, and I will be contributing to this session today. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we drive right in, let me take a minute or two to do a few quick introductions. Food Animal Concerns Trust, or FACT, is a national nonprofit organization headquartered in Illinois that works to ensure that all food producing animals are raised in a humane and healthy manner. We accomplish this by supporting humane farmers through our humane farming program, promoting policies that make foods from animals safe and healthy to eat through our safe and healthy foods program, and generally help consumers to make informed food choices. Please visit our website at foodanimalconcernstrust.org to learn more about our farmer and consumer services. At this time, I'm giddy, I really am giddy, to have my old teammate and dear friend, Larissa McKenna, and another one of my favorite people on the earth, Cara Shannon, join me as we take a deep dive into our Fund of Farmer Grants. Cara is the Director of Farm Animal Welfare Policy for the ASPCA, where she leads the organization's state and federal policy work to end factory farming, reduce farm animal suffering, and support higher welfare farmers as part of the transition towards a more humane food system. A New York native, Cara Cara earned her bachelor's degree in environment and development from McGill University and a JD and certificate in food and agricultural law from Vermont Law School. Cara lives in Mount Pelier, Vermont with her scruffy rescue dog, Luna. You all probably remember the wonderful Larissa, who served as FACT's previous Humane Farming Program Director and administered the Fund of Farmer Grant Program from 2012 to 2023. In its first year, FACT awarded only a mere $12,000 to nine farmers. Last year, we distributed over $250,000 to 87 farmers and ranchers. And Larissa is the reason why and how we got there. She is the reason why this program is what it is today. While Larissa has moved, recently moved on and now works with AmeriCorps, she continues to be a huge fan and supporter of FACT. She lives in Wisconsin with her husband and two absolutely adorable sons. We are lucky to have these two amazing women with us today to share their experience and expertise. I have never been happier to host a webinar. Just wanted to say that one more time, just in case you were wondering how I felt about this webinar. <laughs> Um, all right, Larissa, next slide. Okay, we're going to try and get through a lot of information over the next half hour or so, so let's just get going. So since 2012, FACT has awarded 608 grants to farmers totaling over $1,110,000. Last year, we gave $250,000 to 87 projects and have the same funding this cycle, which is very exciting. Our 2024 grants to farmers seeking or holding animal welfare certification are generously underwritten by the Society for the Protection of Cruelty to Animals, ASPCA, as we all know it, as, and they have been doing this for us for many years. The 2024 application period is now open as of this morning, and I think almost all of the glitches are dealt with, thanks to Larissa and, and my other colleague, uh, Katie Mead, uh, for helping me get through all that and make sure that um, it's ready for you guys. Applications will close at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time, January 15, 2024. We will answer relevant questions as they pop up, hopefully, um, as we can, but most questions will be answered at the end. Remember to put your questions in the Q&A rather than the chat. Uh, they're much more likely to get answered, and we probably will have a lot of questions. So probably the most commonly asked question is, is my farm and is my project eligible? To answer this question, we need to look at three main things. The first thing is, are you a working independent family farm or are you operated by a recognized tribal entity? The second thing would be, what species of animals will benefit the most from your project because we only fund certain species? And question number three would be, will your project benefit the lives of your livestock? And if it does, um, then you probably are eligible. So let's start with farm eligibility, uh, which is number one. 
So one of our eligibility requirements is that applicants be working independent family farms or operated by federally recognized tribal entity. These are farms on which a family, individual, or tribe owns the animals, is engaged in the day-to-day -day management of the farm and its animals, derives a share of livelihood from the farm, and produces a livestock product for sale. Should you be selected to receive a Fund of Farmer grant, you will be required to furnish a copy of your farm Schedule F or comparable from the most recent tax filing. If you haven't filed taxes for your farm in the past, but expect to do so for the year 2023, before the grants are awarded in May of 2024, you may indicate this in your application. For example, because I do love an example, Judy Allen and have been raising livestock for a long time providing her family with healthy, nutritious food, but she's never actually sold any of the delicious meats she raises. Does have a Schedule F for the row crops, which is the, is the main focus of her business. Is, is um, Judy eligible for a Fund a Farmer grant? And if you wouldn't mind just putting that, sorry, I had to change my video. If you wouldn't mind just putting uh, that yes, Y or N in the chat, um, do you think she would be eligible? So, yes, Molly, you are correct. Judy is not eligible because Fund to Farmer grants are for working livestock and poultry farms only. Okay, next slide. One of our eligible, oh, whoops, sorry. I have to switch also. I'm so used to being the one that does the slide deck, Marissa, sorry. <laughs> Here's another example. So George is the executive director of Learn to Farm, a nonprofit farm school that works with youth interested in agriculture. His farm school sells eggs from their chickens to the community to help support his work. Is George's farm eligible for a fund to farm a grant? Y or, y or N in the chat, please. Um, so no. Um, he is not because nonprofits are not eligible. There's more funding out there for nonprofits than there are for for-profit farms. So we really are focused on for-profit farms. However, if George had a for-profit business entity for the egg laying part of his business, then he would be. So here's another one. Uh, Fred with High on the Hog Farm is part of a cooperative of pasture-based hog farmers who purchase feed as a group and market their pork under one label, but maintain their own independent farms. Fred leases his land, but he also schedules, well not, but, and he schedules a schedule F. So is Fred eligible for a funder farmer grants? Uh, yeah, there is no requirement that farmers sell directly to the public or that they own the land they farm. So next let's look at the animal species that the fund of farmer grants cover. So let's start with livestock. So on-farm projects must impact one or more of the livestock species shown. So that's meat and dairy cattle, meat and dairy goats, meat and dairy sheep, bison, water buffalo, any of those kinds of things, and hogs raised in the U.S. or one of the seven U.S. territories. Currently, projects based on rabbits, bees, aquaculture, or the production of raw milk for human consumption are not eligible. And that last one, the production of raw milk for human consumption, um, that's that can be something that gets people up in arms. And as a person who actually has a herd share and does <laughs> do raw milk. I totally understand, but that's where we are currently. And um, I, or maybe that's a fight for another day, but this is where we are this year. So uh, let's move to poultry. Um, so one of the following poultry species must be, um, must be the focus of your fund to farmer grant project. So that would be broiler chickens, meat and layer ducks, meat and layer geese, and laying hens and or turkeys. I guess if you have turkey eggs, that's, that would work too. Raised in the US or one of the seven US territories. That is a common question. Um, you can be in one of the US territories. You don't just have to be in the US or the continental US. All right, let's do some examples. Because I do love an example. Sally and June with Our Slice of Heaven Farm would like to cross fence a 10 acre pasture for their dairy cows, which they sell milk from for human consumption from. Is Sally and June's project eligible for a fund of farmer grant? So yes. All right, so this was a little bit of a trick question. <laughs> so 
It is, so long as the project doesn't directly relate to the production of raw milk. So if they just, if the, if Sally and June focus on their dairy cows and how their dairy cows or even their cows are going to be helped, they don't even have to call them dairy cows, and that they don't mention that they do raw milk from, from for human consumption, then there's no reason why they would not be eligible. But if they focus on the fact that they produce uh, raw milk for human consumption, or even if they ask for um, maybe equipment for a milking pot or something like that, then they would not be able to. So we have Floppy Ear Farm. So Alan with Floppy Ear Farm produces mostly rabbit on his small farm. He sells eggs from his flock of layers to the community. His project would benefit both his rabbits and his layers. Is Alan's project eligible, yes or no? Um, let's see. Yep, so... You guys, well, no, it seems to be a mixed bag over there. Yes, it is eligible so long as the focus is on the layers and not on the rabbits. So again, it's okay that he raises rabbits. And even if that is the main part of his farm business, but the project has to mainly benefit his layers and not his rabbits currently. Hopefully we can get that change for next year, but that's where we are this year. So now let's go over the eligible project uh, uh, projects. Yes, sorry. Before we can talk about if your project is eligible, we should probably go over the three fund of pharma grant types, which seems to be very confusing for a lot of people. And to be honest with you, the first time I applied for a fund of pharma grant, I was really confused by it as well. But it really isn't that hard. So there are three different kinds. We've got certification grants, which are for uh, farmers seeking a humane certification. So these grants will be made for on-farm projects that help improve animal welfare. We have um, capacity grants for projects that would help farms that already hold a humane certification to build capacity or maintain certification. So by building capacity, you could um, be, want funding for a squeeze chute or an on-farm freezer or something that would help you um, market or something to do with your sales and the distribution of your certified products, but you have to ha already hold a certification. And pasture grants are for farmers to improve or expand pasture for their animals. In fact, will fund projects that will help farmers transition to pasture-based systems, expand animals' access to well-managed pasture, and improve the quality of pasture for animals. Farmers do not need to hold or be seeking certification. These grants will be made for on-farm production-related projects that will improve animal welfare and expand pasture-based systems. Your farm could actually fit into all three of these if you are already certified um, animal welfare approved for your hogs, and then you would like to get certified for your beef cows through a pasture improvement type project, then you could be qualified for all three. Not very many people can be, but there are a lot of projects that actually fit into two, two different categories. And the reason why they, we have the different categories is because the funding for each of those categories comes from different sources and there are different requirements for, um, for those funding sources. So, um, let's break these three types down, and we are going to go ahead and start with the certification grants. So they are for grant, they are grants for farmers seeking to become animal welfare approved, that's AWA, by a greener world, certified humane or global animal partnership, also known as GAP, and animal welfare certified. But that's only for steps four and five and up. Um, the one, two, and three, we would not, we that would not qualify. These grants will be made for on-farm projects that help improve animal welfare. So let me give you a couple of examples of last year's um, awardees. Uh, we had All Family Farm in Middleton, New York. They received $2,876 for a one and a quarter acre expansion of their Berkshire pig paddocks into woodland to create a rotational pasture system to meet the requirements for certified humane animal welfare. So they, because they are also doing um, an pasture improvement, they would also be able to check, not only they check the certification box, they would also check the pasture improvement box. So they could actually, um, be, they, they are an example of being able to fit into two boxes. So Boxcar Farm in Cedar Grove, North Carolina received uh, $3,000 for the purchase and installation of automatic insulated waters for their farmstead dairy goat herd. And they are walk, work, working towards becoming certified AWA by a greener world they would only be able to check one box and that would be the certification box. So funding for grants to farmers who are seeking certification are underwritten by the generous support from the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals or ASPCA. And I'm gonna let Cara discuss these certifications because that's that seems to be one of the things that can be the most confusing. So go ahead, Cara. 
It's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. Although that was, that was okay. you almost got me. Those examples were very good. I appreciate the quiz. Oh, you I almost got you. That was my goal. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hi, everyone. So I'm just going to be quick, just really want to share that for those that are interested in certification, that the ASPCA does have a really helpful resource to help you figure out which of those three might make the, mo the most sense for your farm. Um, it's free. It's online. Um, you can see the URL here, ASPCA.org slash farm certification. And we published this a couple of years ago now. We've updated it a few times since then, um, but we really want it to be kind of a one-stop shop if you were interested in certification and figuring out which one is the best fit. It's all in here. So we have everything from, you know, the different business benefits of the certifications to really in-depth standards comparison charts. Um, we have case studies from farmers who are certified. So you can hear directly from those folks how that experience was like for them. We also have a much more built out funding section so that you can find out in addition to obviously these amazing fact grants, what other both federal and state and private funding opportunities are available to you. So you can make the best use of those. Um, and just a little bit of information around labeling and what you need to do to actually go about using whichever certification you might go forward with. Go to the next slide, Larissa. So here's just an example of the of the types of um, comparison charts that we've got in the guide here. And we have both this one you'll see on the screen here is from our kind of broader over overarching look at the different programs and how they differ in terms of costs, which animals they certify, which is obviously kind of one of the first questions you ask, do they even off, do they have standards for your animals? For example, like GAP doesn't have dairy goat standards. They're not certifying dairy goats. So that's what you're raising. You easily cut that one off your list and then you're just left to compare, you know, certified humane versus um, AWA by a greener world. I will say a lot of pasture-based farms and smaller ones, especially if most of your sales are direct to consumer, whether that's through farmers markets or CSAs or on the farm, do tend to go with the greener world on cost alone, really. It's by far the most affordable. You're going to be between $100 to $200 a year for that certification versus over $1,000 for, for both of the other two. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, great, I think, benefits to that certification that I know Sam has talked about before. She used to have that just in, you know, their their standards are really in-depth and they also have a great team of folks that can help you. Um, you know, you can reach out before you even are certified. You're in that process and they can help talk you through. Once you get certified, all of these programs have great marketing resources to help you take advantage of them. Um, but like I said, really recommend checking out the guide if you're not sure which one you is right for the farm. Again, it's got stamp, it's got species specific comparisons too. So you can see, for example, what are the space requirements that AWA wants versus certified humane? How, how does your farm stack up to that? What records do they require? They all have, that tends to be the thing that we hear most from farmers. It's like the biggest thing that's holding them back from getting these is there really are some, um, you know, you have to be detailed. You have to keep records of things. Um, I think most folks say at the end of the day, both their animals and their farm benefit from those records, but just getting over that initial hump is hard. Um, but yeah, that's it from me on so, this. Tara, there is one question in the um, in the Q and A. Um, it's from Christine. And what is the advantage for farms that are an farm animal welfare certified? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple advantages. I think it's it's really going to depend which markets you're selling into, which of these programs is going to have the most advantage for you. Um, but kind of on the face, what these programs do is they communicate even to your customers that might not be able to talk to you directly or come out to your farm the way that you're raising your animals. So they already know they can see that logo and they can recognize all the great things that are happening on your farm. Um, and especially in a marketplace that, as I'm sure everyone's aware, there's a lot of labeling and images being used by um, other folks that might not, you know, can be misleading. So these are really a sign for consumers in the marketplace that they can they can trust that product. Um, and they're getting pushed that from, you know, groups like the SPCA. We have an entire consumer facing program called Shop With Your Heart that helps direct folks to these welfare certified farms, but also major, you know, consumer reports. Um, it's a, definitely a growing group and a, a growing focus of different consumer organizations. Um, but also we found if you're if you're interested in selling into like locally into your public institutions, like schools, um, there's a big push in those places to support farms that have these welfare certifications. Um, so there's a lot of marketing opportunities that go along with it. And I, I will add that um, certainly if you're just starting out, it's a really great way to differentiate yourself 
in the marketplace. Um, once you get, um, Cara and I've had this discussion before, but once you you have name recognition, it doesn't, um, just in our experience, it didn't really matter quite so much. But even today, <clears throat> if we ever added, we added some boiler chickens like two or three years ago, and we went to um, AWA and looked at all of their guidelines so that we made sure that we were in compliance, even though we don't have any intention of getting certified. But that's just because we've been doing this for a long time and we don't need to, but it's a if you're just starting out, you really should look into it and um, and get, it's not that big of a deal. I think I'm now handing it over to Larissa. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, I had to unmute myself and do the slide. But thank you. Great um, to be with you all today, this evening. And thanks for inviting me, Sam. And um I'm just going to follow up on some of the stuff that Kara just talked about. So the capacity grants, they are grants for welfare certified farmers. So folks that already have one of those three certifications that um, she talked about um, and they're for projects that would, um, oops, sorry, that would help them build um, capacity, kind of grow maybe their operation or maintain their certification. So these grants can be for production related projects or for projects that are related to sales, marketing, distribution of the certified projects. So I have a couple of examples of our uh, grantees from this past year that received ca capacity uh, grants, one being Ozark Valley Bison Farm um, LLC, which is based out of Fox, Arkansas. They received $3,000 to purchase and install fencing to increase available pasture land for a herd of uh, approximately 60 bison. The farm already holds the, wealth, the certified animal welfare approved label by Greener World. Um, and as Sam mentioned before, this, this project is an example of one that would also be eligible for a pasture grant. <clears throat> Another example of a capacity grant that was awarded last year was to Pompey's Rest, also uh, slash Jackson Family Pastures in South Carolina. And they were awarded $3,000 to purchase and install a squeeze chute to uh, safely and humanely work their cattle. This farm also holds the certified animal welfare approved by a greener world certification. Um, and then yes, this, the capacity building grants and the certification grants um, are have been for, man, Kara, I forget how many years it's been now, but seven, seven, six or seven years, yeah, I think. Yeah, um, seven. The ASPCA has been really, really generously um, underwriting them and um, really helping, you know, dozens and hundreds of farmers along the way. <clears throat> and then of course we have our pasture grants, kind of a, a bigger, broader category of grants. And these are for farmers to in, improve or expand pasture for their animals. Uh, factual fund projects that will help farms transition to pasture-based systems, expand animals access to well-managed pasture and improve the quality <clears throat> of the pasture for their animals. Farmers do not need to, to be uh, seeking or already holding certification. These grants will be made to on-farm for on-farm production related projects that would improve animal welfare and expand pasture-based systems. So some examples from this past year, we have Hen and Harvest Farm in uh, California. They received $3,000 to purchase portable fencing and forage mix to establish a flock of sheep in a rotationally grazed system that will improve the quality of pasture. And then the other side of the country, we have High Hog Farm in Grayson, Georgia. They received $2,970 to per protect and maintain ongoing silver pasture developments by adding um, uh, deer fencing and incorporating natural soil building strategies, such as compost tea applications for their chickens, sheep, and rabbits on pasture. So the pasture grants are underwritten by uh, a foundation called flow or food land opportunity um, and for farmers that are within 200 mile radius of Chicago. So there's that. And then there's just a bunch of generous support from individuals and other foundations that, um, that um, donate to FACT. So that's how we fund those, those types of grants. Uh, and just as a reminder, um, if your farm or your project fits into one, more than one category, you may select different multiple types on the application form. It's pretty, it's pretty obvious. It's one of the first questions. Um, that we lead you through. So looking back at this past year when we gave out our grants in March, 2023, um, as you can see, I was let's just let folks kind of take in the numbers on the slide because there's a lot there. 
but we received um, over 800 applications. Um, and you can kind of see the number per type of grant category um, and you know the percentage uh, of of the of the number that was actually funded and the, the total amount that we were able to fund. So it's it is a very competitive process. Um, that being said, there are ways to really you know keep your application competitive and and strong. And um, we'll talk about the, a couple of those in a second too. So this is something that we have on our website, and maybe Sam can share the um, the link in the chat. This was a video that we recorded a couple of years ago, but it's still really um, pretty applicable. I watched it yesterday just to make sure. And besides the dates <laughs> being out of date, of course, and um, there's a couple of uh, sections that have been updated in the application form, which we're gonna talk about um, next. Everything else is, is pretty relevant and, and um, up to date. Um, we, we talk about, you know, how to register for an account on the Good Grants uh, website, which is what we've been using for the last, this is the third year. So if you've applied for a grant from FACT within the last couple of years, you might be familiar with this. And in fact, if you already have an account and you can remember your login information, you can use it again this coming year and you'll be able to access um, other applications that you've submitted pr uh, previously. So Sam wanted me to also tell you that most of the communications are gonna come through the portal, the Good Grants portal. So make sure that you check your spam folder. <laughs> it can go to spam, it gets flagged there, um, especially by Gmail, it seems. So um, you know, just make sure you check in there uh, every once in a while, make sure that um, you see the messages that are coming through. Um, in this video, we do talk also about um, what happens if you forget your password, how to, um, you know, what the, what the actual, parts of the application are, um, you know, just some reminders and tips about following the instructions that are given that really helps helps the reviewers, um, you know, read your application and, and uh, you know, it gives you a little bit of a clue about what they're looking for in the questions and how to answer them. Um, there are some word limits. We also ask that you please don't um, use your farm name after the first contact page, um, just so that we can keep the review process anonymous and really fair to everyone involved. Um, so yeah, just a, a plug for that. And, um, and then the parts of the application that have changed this past, this past year, which I think they're really good improvements. Um, we, we received some input from our final reviewers. So we have um, a bunch of, of farmers that are reviewing these applications um, after Sam, Sam goes through them, <laughs> uh, and they're reviewing them anonymously for for the you know all the different parts of the project. Um, but one of the, the sections that they that we're doing slightly different this year is the budget section. Um, I have to move my. That's okay. Is three sections. The first two are where you're going to list items about what your grant, what you'd like your grant to cover. And then the third is for items that are out of pocket items and labor. Okay, so the first table looks pretty much the same as it has in the past if you're familiar with the grant application. Um, it's, it kind of asks you for line items of, of materials. Um, and so eligible expense categories include supplies, equipment, and shipping costs as they relate to your project. Try to share as much as possible uh, without going into you know, too much of the minutia. Um, reviewers, for example, don't need to know how many nails you'll be using, but that you're buying nails is you know, something to, improve, uh, to in include. Funds will not be awarded for operational expenses such as animals other than livestock guardian animals. Um, also, it won't be uh, awarded for feed and land or projects related to the slaughter of animals, which is something uh, Sam mentioned earlier. Um, also, no project costs incurred before funds are distributed are eligible. So that means if, if you buy something in um, December uh, and the grant is not um, set to come out until next March, then those December expenses are not eligible. So the second table is for labor, where you should list costs like professional fees, hired specialty labor, travel, and training as they re, uh, apply to your proposal. Funds will not be awarded to farm labor, which includes uh, employees, the applicant, or family members, unless as contract labor. So these, this is a little bit of a, um, I wouldn't say a change from past years, but it's a little bit more clear. 
the, the last section, budget section, is uh, for your out-of-pocket expenses. And here's where, where you'll list any materials over the requested funding amount and for any farm la labor. Keep in mind that no project costs incurred before funds are distributed are eligible. So we're going to do a couple of examples here, too. And so um, what I thought, because there's so many question, questions within a question on the slide, if, if folks have the, the thumbs up and down, I think that's it shows up on the bottom of your screen. So maybe we'll do it that way. Or you can you can type it into the chat as well. I just can't keep track of that. And there's um, there's a lot to ask here. So the scenario is Pete with Peter's happy hens would like to fund a mobile chicken coop so he can move his hens from a stationary coop next to his pond out to pasture. A much better for the hens and for um, his environment. So his expenses include, so tell me if this is eligible eligible or not, portable fencing, yes or no, thumbs up or thumbs down. All right, you're right. Eligible, yes. How about wood for the coop? Yep, good. Replacement laying hens. Right, so, <laughs> uh-oh, <laughs> we have a, uh, all right, I like that. How about a livestock guardian dog? Yes, yes, so livestock garden dogs are, are great. How about training for the dog? Make sure it's effective in its in its work, yep. And then labor for Sally, who, his, who is his farm employee? Nope, okay, awesome. So we'll, that's great. The next, <laughs> you guys are great. Next one is Iowa's best beef, and this is with Helene. Helene would like to fund a frost-free water line for her back pasture, which is the best pasture during the winter for her cows. Her expenses include water line. I already see lots of people saying yes to that. How about three new frost-free hydrants? That's right. How about a frost-free hydrant purchased three years ago? No, sorry. I feel like I should have like a, a buzzer or something. Um, and then how about dig and dad, dig it dance, ditch digging service. That is quite a mouthful, Sam. I know you made that up. But. I, I do like alliteration <laughs> and I thought you'd appreciate it too. <laughs> dig it dance, ditch digging service. Dig it dance. I had to like yeah, <laughs> go fast on that. Okay. So that is a yes, because that is a professional um, service. Awesome. All right. And then one last one, here we go. Where, where, who, Hugo, we go. Also a Sam farm name. Um, they would like to fund a humane slaughter catch pen for their birds. How about, yes or no, covered catch pen. Uh-oh, <laughs> I, I like the laughing face. So keep in mind, this is all about slaughter. It's all about slaughter. That's the, the trick here. Um, covered catch pen. Uh -uh. Yep, wood for the run, cleaning supplies, right because this project is essentially all about um, something that's that's focused only about slaughter. It does not fund any of those of those um, items. Okay, good job. Thanks for making those up, Sam. So this is, I think, the last slide I'm doing. But uh, yeah, so the application press, uh, application opened this morning. It's good to go. I checked it out. I got in there. It looks great, Sam. And <laughs> I, like I said, if you already have an, an account from past years, you, you know, go go for it. You'll find your you'll find some of your work from before. If you need to create a new account, that's fine too. Um, but I will also say the so the application deadline is mid uh, January, January fifteenth, um, the last minute of of the day. I will say that the earlier you can apply, the better, because a lot of people apply that last. Gosh, that last week, but really that last couple days. And if people come up with questions or have some kind of technical difficulty, it's really tough for, for FAC staff to, you know, help you adequately and make sure that um, you're having a good, you're, you know, you're able to submit your application, and have a good experience. So I would work ahead on that. It's not, it, it's, it's not a huge application, but it's, um, it will take, you know, an, a couple of hours probably to pull your stuff together. So after you, um, submit it, submit it maybe early. Uh, there is a little bit of a, a, a wait, um, but that's because we expect to have a, a bunch of applications and it takes a bit for, for those to, to, to be processed. And Sam might be back in touch with you if, if she needs additional information or something didn't upload right. So just keep, like she said, keep an eye out for any emails. But late January into February, that's when the grant review committee will be reviewing the eligible applications. Um, 
and then you know give them about a couple of weeks to a month to to go through them um, because every application has several sets of eyes on them. There's people take this very seriously and really want to um, you know give it the respect the work that you put into your application. Um, by late February, hopefully, decisions will be made, and Sam will be sending out paperwork to the selected applicants. Um, after that paperwork comes back into her, um, she'll give you the okay to start your project and spend the money. Um, checks are are issued um, right after that, so you'll the checks will probably be in March sometime. We we'll also get in touch with anyone else that was not selected to let you know about the status of your application as well. Right, Sam? I, I assume that's yeah. Um, and then there is an, an interim reach report due in October next year, and then a final report in, um, in 2025, because the grants themselves go for about 15 months, right? Yes. So a little bit longer than a year you'll have for your project. I think that's it. I'm going to turn it back over to you, All Sam. All right. So we've got some resources and I'm going to put them in the chat, but I will also be sending them in a follow-up um, e in the follow-up email tomorrow morning. Um, we've got so many things that Larissa has put together over the years and a few things I've put together um, just based on what you know, people's questions and where we felt like people have needed um, some clarity or some help. So we've tried to be as, as helpful and as flexible as possible. And if there's something that you need beyond that, um, um, you know, please feel free to reach out. And if we can help you, we will. Um, so, oh, wait, I'm on the wrong one. Sorry. How decisions are made. <laughs> Sorry, the next slide is about the resources that are now in the chat. So how decisions are made. Um, so how well the proposed project will help in, um, the farm improve animal welfare. That is the biggest one. If you're not gonna improve animal welfare then um, in your project, then it's probably not going to get very far. So how well is the proposed, how well the proposed project is designed and if it will help the farm reach the intended goal. And if the applicant's commitment to achieving certification for certification grants, is there sufficient expertise? Um, so I guess with the with the achieving certification, that would be, do you know what which certification agency you wanna go through? Do you know which um, goals this, uh, or which um, criteria this, your particular project will answer so that you can get your certification? So we don't just want you to say, I would like to be animal welfare approved, and then that's it and there's no more discussion about it. We'd like to know, um, you know, I would like to increase the size of my my layers, have the, the laying area for my layers so I can satisfy AWA's sort of um, requirement for no more than five hens per, um, per nest box. I don't even know if that's true, but that kind of thing. And is there, is there sufficient expertise to complete the project? So if you say that you're gonna dig, you're, you're gonna dig, or you're gonna put, you're gonna put in a berm to help um, with wind during the winter, and you're gonna do it all by yourself, even though you've never operated a backhoe before in your life. You don't even really know what a berm is. And you're probably not gonna get very far. But if you've hired Dig It Dave's ditch digging <laughs> service, then <laughs> then maybe you know that would that would show that you've done some research and that you do have the expertise, or that you've hired the right person to finish the project. If the timeline and the proposed steps are achievable, again, if you were gonna hand dig that berm and you were gonna do it in a month, then obviously that's not gonna happen. If the budget is reasonable and if it's related to the project. So I can't even think of an example off the top of my head. I guess if you, I know, but you, you get that. So in general, while the number of animals that will benefit from the proposed project is not a standalone factor, it may be taking, taken into consideration when scoring comparable projects. So that's really gonna sort of come come when it's down to the wire, when you've got two people who score, and we, and we do, there's a numerical score that's a, so that the reviewers give to each question. And then when those are added up and average, because more than one person will, vi will view your, um, your application, and you happen to be right in par with, um, and you raise you raise a hundred chickens a year, broiler chickens, and you're right on the same um, same same number of points as somebody who raises five thousand. The person who raises five thousand is probably going to just pip you just that little bit. Um, 
And now we can go to resources, but I've already shared that. So I'm ahead of the game. <laughs> so, But I will share all of these resources. Don't feel like you have to copy and paste them um, from the chat because I will send them in an email, a follow-up email. And that's going to be to the email that you registered with. So if you incorrectly put in your email and um, accidentally put in your email wrong um, and you don't get an email from me tomorrow, follow up because it means I couldn't figure out what your real email was. Some of them I can figure out, but some of them just it's I can't even guess. So anyway, so I guess from now we'll just go ahead and do questions. Um, we've got quite a few in the Q&A, and I realized, Larissa, that there's actually a question I don't know the answer to. This is why I needed you here. Um, so if somebody, it was actually, uh, I said I, I answered it, and I don't know that I answered it correctly. So it's about fiber sheep. Are fiber sheep eligible um, if, they do, if they're never slaughtered? Um. I don't have to the, the answer to that either, Sam. Um, I know that they're included in our um, principles. Okay, so. so if they're included in our principles, then yeah, sure, I answered it right. We'll go with that. <laughs> All right, and um, so, so what about a uh, water system for animal husbandry, if you need to dig a well or pond water conversion? So yeah, that would be something, but um, you're probably better off going through because uh, you'll get more money from NRCS or from your soil and water. Although when I, the very, well, I think it was the very first grant I ever got from FACT. I only got a couple, but years ago, this is before I was working for FACT. So there was nothing sketchy about it. But I <clears throat> I did a pond exclusion project with by soil and water. And I, um, I, so I put in automatic waters through them. And then my project with FACT was to extend that, that, um, uh, that water system, so ex extend those pipelines into my hogs to provide my hogs um, automatic waterers as well. So FACT funded the hog part of it, but you know that project was like a, I don't know, a $20,000 project, which my soil and water paid the majority of, um, but FACT obviously wouldn't be able to put much of a dent in it. So I guess that would, that would depend on, um, you know, what, how much of your project you want to get funded. Uh, would you say so, Larissa? Yeah, that was good. So would this include a perennial based system with chickens ranging within it? So I'm assuming that would be a pasture, you would want a pasture project, Lois? Okay, she means specifically for agroforestry based system, for an agroforestry based system, so yeah. All right, Cara, this one's for you. When it comes to certificate certificates, does the California Prop 12 certificate count? It's their animal care program. Sure, so this for others who aren't aware, um, California recently passed a law called Proposition 12, which bans the sale of animals coming from certain confinement systems in the state. So anyone who's using gestation crates um, or battery cages or veal crates. Um, and to enforce that law, they're requiring folks that sell into the state to have uh, certificates that show that they aren't using those systems. Um, part of that, the way that they're doing that is that they're actually allowing existing certification programs to qualify as a certificate. So a certified humane or an, AD, an AWA certification, California will accept that. So the short answer is that no, just a California Prop 12 certification isn't going to qualify for this grant, um, simply because it's not a holistic certification. All they're doing is checking that you're not using those cages and crates. It doesn't at all ensure higher welfare for animals beyond that. But that's a nice twofer if you get the other certifications because <laughs> they will qualify. Um, so uh, can funds be used to pay for summer interns? And I think that um, that would be, summer intern would be considered an employee, a farm employee. So I would say no. What would you say, Larissa? I think that, yeah, the differentiation um, between like professional, like service-based contractors is different than like, yeah. If I feel like yeah, so it really is if you're talking about labor it's going to be you hired a fence company to put your fencing in or you hired dig it Dan stitch digging <laughs> service or so it would be professional professional services okay Shanna asks can you apply or qualify if you already received funding partial funding from another organization such as your local CAIP or USDA grant some of these grants don't cover the total amount for the projects and don't include labor 
So yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, for sure. I think that that's, yeah, there is, that's as long as you're not kind of double dipping in, right. you know, you're getting everything fully funded by one and then you go back and try to, um, you know, get more for that same project. But that does ex explain there is a part on the app, um, the budget section that says, how are you going to pay for the rest of this project, especially if it's a big project. Um, and that's, right. you know, that's a fine funding source. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, like we're, so there is in that uh, third budget table, that's where you would put um, what you've already received. And people have done that before where they've said that, you know, it's going to, you know, that this grant is going to cover this particular amount and then um, I'm going to cover the rest of it. If you've not already received the grant. So that example I gave earlier with the soil and water, um, I had, when I first applied and I did not receive the grant for the exact same project, I had yet to finish that project. Um, it was just still in the works with soil and water and I didn't have a contract with them and I hadn't done any of the work and I did not receive the grant. So that's where that kind of thing is. Maybe a reviewer would look at that and not think that that was a, a great use of funds. So it might be better to, you know, finish that project first and then get then add on to it the following year. Um, that's, you know, really it's going to be up to the reviewers. What is the budget for funding on pasture management grants? So uh, $3,000 is the limit for all of the grants. Can more than one grant be submitted? No, only one grant can be submitted per farm. So you you know, you can't have another member of your family or a you know, farm partner also apply. So it's just, it's per person and per farm. All right. Can you have multi-species certification if you operated a multi-species rotational grazing system? So I think that's the certification question, Cara. I think if I understand the question, you're basically asking if you can be applying for certification for all of your animals. And, and yes, and it can be just one too, but a lot of folks, especially that are doing diverse animals, but all on pasture will go and get everyone certified at once. So that's not an issue. You just have to pick which which thing you're getting funded because I'm sure there'll be a lot to do. But. And I answered a question in the chat. It was about uh, leased land and yes, you do not have to own your property. All right. Larissa, maybe this one's the one you can answer. If you wanted to improve the type of fencing you have on your farm, such as trading out barbed wire to plank fencing or goat sheep fencing, um, I, I guess the question is, is that a, would that be a good project? So I would think it would be. Yeah, I would think so, um, especially if you, you could, you know, show the animal welfare um, improvements, you know, protection, and then also like, yeah, that they're able to, you know, I feel like, any kind of fencing improvements like that, um, if you, as long as you can make the case for it, it's it's usually it's usually eligible. And Lisa is trying to get clarification on the fiber sheep, and you do not need to be sorry, Lisa, because I totally botched that. Um, so yes, fiber sheep um, would be eligible because they are one of the um, uh, one of the animals that we have um, we have guidelines on. Okay, Andrew says, I'm sorry, I missed the first few minutes of the webinar. Does the project have to be an improvement to an existing situation or could it be a beginning farmer starting from scratch? Larissa, you wanna answer that? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends exactly um, where you're starting from. I mean, we have a lot of new beginner, beginning, you know, first five year farmers um, that have received grants. Um, However, I think the, the thing that keep into consideration is the Schedule F requirements. And if you have filed one for the last year or two, or if you will file one for 2023, and you, you'll be able to kind of show that before the grants are awarded in March 2024, then, then that's, that usually is, you know, satisfies. That's usually kind of like the, the bar that's hardest for most folks to, um, you know, to get over. Um, but yeah, it's it's for people that are already in existence that want to improve their um, pasture or one of the other types of grants, um, or that kind of 
need a little help to to get started. There is a requirement that you have to, like I think Sam mentioned, that you you have to already be raising animals of some sort mm -hmm. and have a Schedule F. I think those are the two that would probably be most relevant to that yeah. that question. So. Toria asks, can money be used to buy seed and equipment to seed a pasture? That we have funded, um, we have funded that, I think even in some of the examples that we talked about um, for, mm -hmm. you know, for perennial pasture and such. Um, I, you know, you want to, you might want to make it part of, you know, part of the larger story of what you're trying to do on your farm. Mm hmm and I think that, yeah, what Larissa just said, just making it part of, um, there's plenty of space for you in, in all the different questions to really talk about your farm and your project and how this is going to impact things. And I think the the squeeze shoot with Don Jackson and with Jackson Family Farms is a really good example because he actually did not get funded for that project two years in a row until he, he, he actually, he and I talked about it because he's a mentor in our mentorship program. And um, he really the reason why he wanted the shoot is one of his he does most of the work on his own and he's in his late 70s and one of his cows went down he just had a head gate and the cow went down and he was out in the pasture by himself and there wasn't anything he could do about it and he almost lost the cow so i was like well tell that story because that's very compelling and it really shows that a squeeze shoot is something you need because you're the main farmer on your farm and you're not 20 anymore <laughs> you can't manhandle that cow the way you could when you were younger and and he got funded and i think the main reason why he got funded was because he really told his story and shared why that was important to him and um yeah while still answering the questions he did a really good job um so what sort of Heidi asks what sort of data is needed to show that seeding a pasture would benefit my sheep flock is fertilizer for pasture eligible my rented pasture has been fallow for 14 years and the plant growth is very sparse now fertilizer fertilizer can be a hot topic with certain um, review people. Uh, you want to take that one, Larissa? <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't think that fertilizer is, it's not on the, the uh, on the list of things that's not, com that's completely, I mean, I think it's, you know, uh, I think you, again, you kind of have to explain what's, what it's needed for. And in some cases, like I know that, um, out West, for example, it's, it's a different situation than out East and how land is managed, you know, and just letting, that that's that that is taken into consideration. We try to have reviewers from all over the country so they kind of know the lay of the land. But um, in terms of data, uh, man, I mean, I've seen I've seen kind of like uh, soil sample reports back, you know, that people will reference all that kind of depth, if you will, um, to just you know going into the concepts of what you're trying to do. You don't have a ton of space to like make it into a research paper per se, but um, to, to explain, like, there are certain known quantities of, I do this, this is what's going to happen, and this is what I'm, you know, the outcome of your intervention. So kind of making it, making it really, connecting the dots for the reviewers is, is super important. Yeah, it's very important. So Tony asks, so if I need pasture equipment, uh, if I need a pasture equipment upgrade and I purchased the said item before February selection process, can the needed equipment I bought prior to the selection? No. Sorry, Tony. And I just had this happen. I got a grant from my county and I really wanted an egg washer and they wouldn't let me get it until I got I got the contract signed. And it was really annoying, but it's the way they're all, every grant's like that. I'm, I will say that like, if it's something that you're, I mean, we showed you the numbers about like how many, you know, grants get funded. So it's, it's competitive. If it's something that your farm really needs, like you might not want to wait around to hear back from Jack about it. You know, like <laughs> yeah. you, might, you might want to pick a different project so that you can wait until March to find out about if that's, if yeah, we're going to buy that anyways. Yeah, because that's the one thing, because that money, if you get a grant for another project, that would free up the money for that that $3,000 for your equipment. Um, so think about it that way. Mark um, basically says that he's not raising animals currently, but is planning to. Um, so no, you actually have to be raising animals currently and you have to be a working farm already. Not, but you can apply in, in a year or two. Um, so yeah, but just not this year probably. Is there a specific practice for silver pasture? NRCS only does drill and kill for the trees. We do not. As far as I know, do we, Larissa? No, I mean, we can, We have lots of resources about solar pasture. We can, you know, if you want to do a little bit of research before 
Yep. We've got some, Jen. yeah, we've got some great webinars on Silver Pastures. Steve Gabriel, who's sort of, uh, he's like the guru and he's done several web webinars for us and he's going to do another one this, this winter. We don't know why yet, but I'm just excited. He's willing to do it again. Um, so Gabriel asked, if you apply for two different categories, could you be awarded 3000 for each category? No, it's a, you get one, what this, because it is such a competitive process. We want to, you know, spread the wealth, so to speak. Okay. Would contract aerial herbicide spraying, you guys are coming up with some really good questions. <laughs> Very specific. Would contract aerial herbicide spraying for invasive invasive species qualify for improving or expanding pasture? I am no. These are these are these are the grants that are going to come up, and I'm going to be texting Larissa and saying, Larissa, what about this one? What about this one? What do you think, yeah. Larissa? I mean, I've seen some. I I think that it would probably be it would probably make it through the eligibility process. Um, but I don't know how competitive it would be with the review committee. I think that's like that's my gut feeling about it. Unless unless it's like this this is the only the only option, which it might be. Like I know that like mm -hmm. there's stuff that's um, there's some certain situations. So yeah, those are tough. We should probably like talk Sam about yeah having a little bit more guidance on that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Anna asks, if your application gets rejected, is there a contact or follow-ups to get feedback for future applications? Yeah, you can certainly reach out to me and I can, I can tell you what I know because I'm not the one doing the reviewing, but I can tell you what is shared with me uh, by the review committee, but that's all I can do is show you that. And I, I can also look at it and see what I think. So, just, you know, you can take that with a grain of salt, but still, <laughs> but um, I've written a lot of grants. I've received, I've received a lot, but I've also not received a lot. So um, I'm sort of in the same boat as you guys. And I have, um, anyway, so, all right. What about fiber goats? We've answered fiber sheep. What about fiber goats? I think they're in the same category, yeah, right? Yeah, they're the same. Yeah. All right. Yes. It's official, Christine. Fiber goats are good too. Okay, so we've get, getting we're coming to the end here. So that's um maybe do one more question. Um, to, uh, Larissa, Cara, do you guys? There's only three left. You guys want to pick one of those? We have answered thirty two questions. You guys, it's amazing. I think it's a record. <laughs> I think the one from Lisa probably has the best question to it in terms of what's a more competitive. Okay, so we have a property, Lisa asks, we have, so we have a property that had a pasture made from woodland, she's in Alaska, when we bought the property last year. The pasture has been retaken over by wild roses, saplings, etc. In order to improve that pasture for our sheep, can we hire heavy equipment operator to clear that pasture for seeding for a more lush grass clover pasture for the sheep? Health and pasture health be covered in that grant? Or would it be better to focus on fencing or rotational grazing? I think that's a really good question. Good one, Cara. Larissa, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's it's hard to say just to uh, not know exactly the, um, you know, what what the the two projects would entail and which would be, yeah, which one would be better in this circumstance. Um, I think you'd have to make an argument, um, a pretty, a pretty um, good argument about clearing land um, to make the re reviewers understand where you're coming from. But I could see that. I think um, some people might think, well, there's other ways you could introduce goats or something like that to eat the roses and saplings rather than use heavy equipment. Um, so I think that's going to have to be a decision that you make, Lisa. Um, and you can always, you know, if it doesn't work this year, apply for next year. I, I I wish we had. We just don't. We're seeing as we're not the ones that do the reviewing. All we can do is just say from past experience. Um, I know that um, you know reviewers. You if you can if you can give a good argument, then you can you have to view it as a persuasive paper. I guess. <laughs> I mean, in this case, yeah, I think that either either one you could probably submit the the project for it probably would be deemed eligible, and if you. Um, you know, all the other requirements and 
Um, I will say that, yeah, there are a lot of projects that get funded for fencing, um, for rotational grazing. Does that make it, you know, does that make it, make it better? I don't know. Um, I don't know, but I will say also, yeah, that like Sam said, like all these like fact and other nonprofits are in the same, the same business of trying to figure out like, how do we, you know, we're always writing grants. We're always not getting them <laughs> like all over yeah. the place. So it's, <laughs> I just want you all to know that it's not just you. It's like, it's like organizations and big, it's, you know, people that are, yeah, it's an occupational to hazard. Write, yeah, <laughs> to write grants don't always get them. So, um, but yeah, I go, I would say go through some of the example, like those, the things that Sam, that Sam um, is going to share out or she did in the chat just to see some of the different projects and, um, you know, see where yours fits along the lines in there. And if you have something, you know, innovative projects are also acceptable. They don't have to be exactly like a, a project that was funded in the past. All right, let's just do a little bit of housekeeping. Do you mind going to the last slide, Alyssa? So we have a few housekeeping items to share before we sign off today. A recording of this webinar on the slides will be available within the next few days and on our webinar page and on our YouTube channel. I will also send up send the links as a follow-up email to all of you who registered who did not attend. Uh, well, of course, you wouldn't know that if, so I'm doing that if you didn't attend. But we also have some other good webinars coming up this autumn and winter, and I will send links to all of our upcoming webinars and other opportunities for farmers or ranchers in that follow-up email. Again, a huge thank you to Laura Sankara. You guys are amazing. I love you both so much. It's always a pleasure. And finally, I would like to thank everyone out there in the audience, especially those of you who stuck it through till the end uh, for your interest, attention, and fantastic questions. I hope that you have a good, had a good experience today and that we stay in touch and connect again soon. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye for now, everybody. Bye, everyone.